Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for prioritizing your own well-being. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host for today. For four decades, FCA has been working across the San Francisco Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, retreats, research, and advocacy. Um, to learn more about Family Caregiver Alliance or access our online resource center, CareNav, please visit us at caregiver.org. Now for some quick housekeeping. During the webinar, your phones or microphones are going to be muted. So if you have any questions, please use the question and answer box on your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Also, we will archive the webinar and archive the slides and they will be available to view on our website, caregiver.org. So today I'd like to welcome our guest, Amy Sabrino. Amy is a licensed clinical social worker specializing in working with people living with Alzheimer's and related dementias and their caregivers. Um, after her experience caring for her grandmother living with Alzheimer's disease, Amy earned her Bachelor of Social Work degree at Southern University Edwardsville and Master's of Social Work degree in Gerontology Specialization from St. Louis University. Uh, in addition to Amy's role at Memory Care Home Solutions, she and her family founded Effingham Area Alzheimer's Awareness, which is a nonprofit in central Illinois that provides rural dementia education and support. Amy is also a lecturer for the Washington University School of Occupational Therapy. So now that you know a little bit more about today's presenter, I'd like to turn things over to Amy. Thanks, Calvin. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today and really looking forward to diving in on kind of what it looks like to prioritize your own well-being as caregivers. So before we get started, um, I if you want to move to the next slide, Calvin. Thank you. Um, so I don't have any potential or actual conflicts of interest. Um, our program at Memory Care Home Solutions is funded in part by the Administration for Community Living, and our grant numbers are listed here with all of that information. Next slide, please. So like Calvin said, um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and my experience has always been in kind of long-term care industry, dementia, and caregiving. And um, like he also said, I, I was a caregiver for my grandmother who lived with Alzheimer's disease. I was about 10 years old whenever she was diagnosed and um, really saw kind of all of the changes and progression through grade school, junior high, high school, college, until she eventually passed away with the disease. <clears throat> and just going through that experience, um, I saw how it affected me um, as a family member and also my other family members in the caregiving role, just kind of coming to terms with the loss and grieving um, her through every stage and also struggling to know how to make things better for all of us. And that was really what inspired me to get into this field. Um, and so I'll be talking a lot today about just kind of the lens from dementia caregiving, I, um, trying to keep things general as well for other caregivers. And then currently, um, in the past year, I became a new mom. And um, I, I think there's a lot of parallels of being a parent and um, being a caregiver. And so I, I, in creating this presentation, I kind of drew on my nights of sleep deprivation, um, not feeling like I knew what I was doing um, and managing uh, the new role of parenthood. Um, and so I'll be kind of referring to that as well throughout today. Next slide, please. And then so um, where I work, Memory Care Home Solutions, so we're a not-for-profit organization that is based out of St. Louis, Missouri, um, although we serve clients all over the country. And our mission is to extend and improve time at home for people living with dementia and their care team. And our team um, is a, a blend of so social work and occupational therapy. And um, what research has shown is that dementia uh, medications really have limited benefits. And 
the supports and, and effects we want in medication can often be met by a non-pharmacological dementia treatment. And so dementia caregiver training, talking about home environment safety, functioning of the daily routine, we can really focus on kind of a lot of the benefits that we're hoping in reducing everyone's stress, keeping someone as independent as possible in a non-pharmacological treatment program. And so I'll go into a little bit more detail kind of within caregiver well-being where is kind of the place of disease management programs and how that all intersects. Next slide, please. And so our goals at Memory Care Home Solutions, um, we're very client-centered, family-focused, um, whatever family looks like to the client. Um, sometimes we work with neighbors, friends, um, really anyone who's the support team. We look at the home environment of trying to create safety and functioning um, kind of goals within the home, looking at how we can improve functioning with activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, and reduce the challenging behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. And we look always to reduce caregiver partner stress, increase their confidence in managing the disease, and reduce any unnecessary healthcare utilization and hopefully long-term care placement as well. Next slide, please. And so where we're headed today, um, I'd like first to begin of just talking about essential components of well-being, and what are ways that you can kind of check in with yourself, build a framework of knowing um, kind of what, what areas of well-being might um, need to be improved or more focused on. And then building on what existing coping strategies and stress, manage stress management strategies you already have, and maybe leaving today with a couple new ideas. And so on the next slide, um, when I was researching information on kind of understanding well being, there's a lot of different definitions and kind of different research out there on how we quantify this. Um, but most of, kind of the, the resources I came across is that there's kind of a general consistent, consistent um, kind of thinking that well-being is simply feeling good and viewing life positively. And so it's kind of made up of a holistic view of a lot of different factors. And so it can be from physical health and well-being, um, financial, economic stability, social supports, emotional and psychological well-being, satisfaction with life overall, and then also with engaging activities. And then it can be domain specific. So in a work or a career, um, a hobby, play, activity, um, there, there's a lot of different domains that we kind of track well-being within our lives. And it is largely subjective. Um, so we're kind of reporting on our own, what we think our well being is. And so the next slide highlights information from um, Dr. Martin Seligman. And this was a framework that I really found helpful and liked for understanding well being. And so he's done a lot of research on just authentic happiness and well being and what that looks like and what, what makes up well being and how we can measure it. And so um, in social science, we all love our acronyms. And so the acronym for today is PERMA. And so Dr. Seligman found that these five components of well-being, whenever um, we're focusing on these, can lead to good positive well-being. And so the, the P is positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And so where we'll go today, we'll kind of just unpack each of those, talk about what it means, what it looks like in respect to caregiving, and then ways to kind of increase that area of well-being um, in your lives and practical ideas of kind of carrying it forward. So if you would go to the next slide, um, we talk first about positive emotion. And so essentially this is really any kind of happiness, cheerfulness, joy, feeling peace, calm, comfort, um, and the absence of negative emotion. And so we know it's unrealistic to kind of move through life with always having positive emotion. 
um, and, and frankly, not healthy. And we, we need that negative emotion, being able to process sad things, frustrating things. Um, and, and that conflict can be healthy sometimes. But whenever we're looking at positive emotion, um, as a caregiver, those feelings can often feel overwhelming um, because we're, we're diving into what a diagnosis means, kind of feeling sad, helpless, angry, frustrated at the situation. Um, there's a lot of negative emotions that can accompany this role. Uh, and as you'll find as we kind of go through each of these components, it's never just negative, it's never just positive. So there are benefits of caregiving, there are negatives, more challenges of caregiving. Um, and, and then like I have listed here, there are a lot of positive moments with the person you're caring for. And so positive emotion itself can come out of being a caregiver and, and having more time, having set aside um, kind of hobbies or activities you do with someone as a caregiver can be really meaningful and contribute to higher positive emotion. Um, and, and so it's kind of the, the crux of all of this is just needing to kind of have the ability that we're acknowledging the negative feelings, the bad feelings, but trying to remain in this present moment. And I think that's where the positive emotion comes into play of we're not ignoring the bad, we're just kind of living in this world where we can acknowledge it, but remain in kind of the positive, happy space where we, where we want to be. And then, so the next component um, is engagement. And so the next slide um, talks about just kind of whenever you're immersed in an activity, you're kind of completely engaged um, you kind of lose track of everything else around you. Um, and, and so it's, if you can spend like an hour or two just doing something you love, um, you kind of have that flow and you're being one with whatever you're doing. And as a caregiver, I think it's almost laughable sometimes how much we are engaged with one thing and we always have a to-do list. We're pulled in so many directions and it, Focusing on one thing can be a luxury. Um, I know just in the past year, I found, you know, if I could just do the dishes without having my toddler kind of pull on my leg or, or have not watching dinner at the same time, and it would be wonderful just to do this. And, and as a caregiver, it's often not really realistic. Um, and But what we find often, especially with dementia, is with chronic disease, one of the strategies we often talk about is kind of living in the present. And so we're just in that moment with someone fully engaged with them. And I think there's good application for that um, as a caregiver, but also for everyone else too. Um, if we're engaged, we're having more positive well-being. Next slide, please. And then so going along with PERMA, so R is for relationships. Um, and so this is high quality, positive connection with others. So we're not looking at the quantity of the friends you have or, or quantity of the relationships you have. This is high quality, positive connection. And as a caregiver, the relationship is often why you're in that caregiving role because you have a relationship with someone who you care about and, and want to support them. I found with my clients that often that relationship might not always be high quality or positive. I've had clients tell me that, you know, the person I'm caring for um, has been abusive to me in the past. We've never had a good relationship, but I feel the, the pull and the responsibility to support them because no one else can and no one else will. And, and so there's often kind of that, that struggle of, even though we might have a good relationship with the person we're caring for, we might always not either. And as a caregiver too, the relationships that you had before the caregiving role, those might change or even end just due to kind of the responsibilities you have and the, the limited time you might have and, and kind of looking at how that might be affected as caregiving goes on. Next slide, please. 
So meaning, so essentially just attributing yourself to a higher purpose. Whoops. If you want to go one back, there we go. <laughs> um, or, or serving something bigger than yourself. And so a lot of people associate faith and religion in this category. Um, others kind of have causes like global warming or ending poverty um, or just having meaning as a kind of family and friends role. And as a caregiver, the meaning and purpose of caring for someone is often why we're a caregiver. We kind of draw meaning and purpose in our role and, and feel, um, feel good whenever we're caring for them. And, and as a caregiver, I find you're often advocating for people on a small and a big level. Um, and so it can look like something as small as like talking to the doctor about why this medication or why this treatment. Um, and then maybe even on a bigger level where you're advocating to a legislator of, we need this research money, we need this funding for additional treatment and support. And so as a caregiver, you're constantly an advocator. Um, you're advocating and uh, throughout the whole disease or, or situation. I've had many clients tell me that um, whenever they're caring for someone, they view themselves as caring and, and supporting kind of them if they were God. And so the faith and religion component of caregiving is, can be so important um, for some people of serving God or the creator, being able to kind of attribute that to something bigger than yourself and, and that your self-sacrifice is, is serving God. I've also found that meaning for some people, there might be limitations now um, in the caregiving role. And so if someone enjoyed volunteering or spending time with grandchildren before, um, and now with caregiving, they might not have that ability, uh, meaning can change and, and look different throughout this experience. And then finally, the last component is accomplishment. And this is just mastering a skill, achieving some kind of goal, and it can be small or large. So something small like getting out of bed on time um, to something large like winning an award. And as a caregiver, I think this is so important because you're constantly learning new skills and strategies and trying to figure out kind of how do I feel accomplished in this role? Um, there's a lot of trial and error in all of this. And, and especially with chronic disease, the goals and accomplishments might look a little bit different than what we're used to. So um, if we're used to like a dramatic change or a dramatic improvement, um, we might have to adjust our expectations to know, okay, hey, we're still accomplishing things even if they aren't as it, significant as we would want them to be. Next slide, please. And so like I said earlier, measuring well-being um, it is very subjective. And so there are a lot of different quizzes that you can take if you're interested in, in like doing that kind of thing. Um, the University of Pennsylvania is where Dr. Seligman, who created PERMA, is, is out of. And he has a website, um, Authentic Happiness, and they have I think around 26 different assessments that you can take, including one that's specific to PERMA and measuring um, all of these components that we just went through. They also have one that's called the VIA Character Strengths. And um, this is one that I've taken kind of at different points throughout my life. And I found that it's very helpful to understand kind of what drives you, what, what strengths do you have, and how is that being carried forward in your life? Are you able to use those strengths? And, and if you are, I, I find usually people have more positive well-being. Um, so if you go to the next slide, whenever I recently took the quiz, these were my top three. And so there are 24 different character strengths that as you kind of go through this quiz, you um, kind of get them ranked of what is the most important to you. 
So for me, love of learning, being able to add knowledge, um, master new skills was my top one, um, followed by love and honesty. And so what this tells us is in terms of well-being is for me to have a positive well-being, I need to be constantly learning. I need to be doing things that engage my brain, excite me, and feel like I'm, I'm kind of getting new information and adding new knowledge. Um, and so it's, it's important in terms of well-being, how are we integrating this? How can we make sure that these strengths are part of every single day for us? Um, and so for me, being able to read a book that is a new topic or watching a documentary that's something new, um, love and honesty, having good social connection, being able to feel close to people I love, and, and having honesty and authenticness in my life, those kind of things drive me. And so I think it intersects really well with PERMA of the components we just listed for well-being. Uh, if we align with kind of the strengths that we have, overall, we're going to have better well-being. Next slide, please. And so as a caregiver, we're gonna kind of take the, the PERMA model and figure out how do we kind of focus on all of these and incorporate it more in our life. And so going back to that, the first one is positive emotion. And so if we look at how do we cultivate positive emotion? What brings us pleasure? Um, what people bring us pleasure, places, activities? And how do we set up a daily routine and our home environment to kind of build that positive emotion. So this is a picture of my windowsill above my kitchen sink. And anyone who knows me knows how much I hate doing the dishes. It's just something I've never enjoyed, always awful. <laughs> but as an adult, I mean, you have to, and this is just part of life. You're, you're going to have dirty dishes as long as you're eating things. Um, and so for me, it was important to figure out how am I cultivating kind of positive emotion in things that I don't really enjoy doing. And so on my windowsill, I have um, things that people I love have given me, um, trinkets from past trips or experiences, and then also kind of the, the life of plants and, and being able to bring kind of the outside in because um, I love being outdoors. And, and as a caregiver, I think you can often have those feelings of isolation and feeling just kind of alone in all of this and being able to cultivate positive emotion spaces and places that um, even though you might have to be here, you, you can feel peace, you can feel joy is so important. And this is just a way um, something that, that might help of just reframing, how am I setting up my home for positive emotion? How am I setting up my daily routine for that too? And then the next slide, I have a picture of a gratitude journal. And so this is a, a, a tool that a lot of my clients use um, who might like something a little more structured. And so try, trying to cultivate kind of the positive emotion throughout their day, um, figuring out kind of how are we tracking mood, emotion, the feelings throughout the day, um, and writing down what went well, what was exciting, what are we thankful for? And so this is a journal that in the morning, it has kind of a place for setting an intention of what um, we hope for for the day, and then an evening reflection. And they also have different um, topics that are um, for self-care, for mindfulness, really wonderful tools to use kind of in, in all of these different areas. Um, but I think the gratitude has a direct connection to the positive emotion of just feeling grateful, feeling excited, feeling kind of that positivity in each day. Next slide, please. So with mindfulness, so this is kind of in the positive emotion, but then also engagement aspects of well-being. Um, so if we look at 
just feeling engaged in our lives. Um, the mindfulness techniques can be helpful of being able to kind of shed whatever stress, whatever kind of residual um, frustration or negative emotion we have, and just being at peace in this moment. Um, the deep breathing exercise is one a lot of people know, um, but a lot of people don't do. But it's, it's something simple of just kind of connecting your breath with your physical kind of ways that you're holding on to stress um, and also stress in your mind. And so taking a deep belly breath, um, not with your shoulders, so keeping your shoulders level, but taking a deep belly breath and then exhaling with some kind of intention, whether it's relax, peace, let go, I'm doing the best I can. Um, I, I think setting those intentions along with breathing is something on the most kind of simplest level, the most simple level, it's really such a great strategy to try. For people who love tech and kind of app-based learning, um, there are a lot of different meditation apps that I found are helpful. I listed a couple here. Um, the Smiling Mind app has a lot of great meditations. The Insight Timer is one that I really like because it has um, a search bar that you can search for different themes. So if there's um, kind of meditations you're looking for on grief or depression, anxiety, you can search and find them really easily. The UCLA Mindfulness Awareness Research Center has really great guided meditation um, downloads through their website, and then they also have an app as well. The sleep scans are some of my favorite um, kind of sleep meditations that I found. So essentially it goes through kind of each muscle group in the body and tenses the muscle and then release. And so you're kind of preparing your body for bed, um, doing a whole body scan and connecting that with deep breathing and kind of letting go of the stress and worry from the day. So if you have trouble with sleeping um, or falling asleep, staying asleep, check the UCLA Mindfulness Center out. Um, they have a lot of really great tools. And then visual imagery exercises. So I find that these are exercises, a lot of my clients who maybe don't like kind of the deep breathing or open meditation, being able to follow along with a visual imagery exercise can be helpful for them because you're kind of following the narrator on a journey to a location, um, a certain space, and encouraged to kind of take in all of the surroundings of what you're imagining. And so I listed a couple of links here of ones that we've done. Um, one is actually just a visual imagery exercise at home. So kind of imagining a space at home that's peaceful and relaxing. And then one is also um, a, a beach. So what, what the waves sound like, what the sand feels like, it's kind of a, a sensory experience. Next slide, please. And so going along with this kind of with engagement, um, we talk a lot about just being able to have time alone for yourself, having a respite during the day. With COVID, this has made it a lot harder, a lot harder. And so I'm finding I'm talking with more clients about how can we cultivate a respite space at home? Um, so even if it's just five minutes here, five minutes there, um, a time whenever you might have families or friends coming in or, or paid caregivers, how can we kind of have a space where you can relax and engage? Um, and so this, th the idea is here to talk a lot about kind of creating this sensory experience. Um, so we're looking at kind of how we're using lighting, um, music, sound, um, touch, like a weighted blanket or heating and cold pads. Um, smell with essential oils, candles, and then having hobbies and interests that we enjoy um, that are portable. We can start up right away. Um, they don't kind of require a lot of kind of setup or prep before. 
this can really help with engagement throughout the day of making sure that we're still prioritizing time for you. And that even if it's just for a couple minutes, you can engage in something completely and block out everything else. And on the next slide, I have ideas on cultivating respite outside of your home too. And as I mentioned, this is different now just in, in our COVID landscape. Um, I've had a lot of clients who are doing outdoor activities and going for a drive. Um, going for a drive has probably been one of the biggest ways of just getting out of the house, knowing whoever you're caring for. Um, if you live with them, you can kind of leave safely. Um, but being able just to kind of get a different scenery and get away. Um, I, I've also had clients that they were able to kind of do some kind of pampering, connection, volunteering in a safe way and, and feeling comfortable with that. And of course, I think as long as we're following CDC guidelines and, and making sure that we're um, following kind of all of the, the best strategies for staying safe during COVID, um, those are good ideas as well. Next slide, please. And so just kind of recapping. So we've talked about positive emotion, engagement, um, meaning is kind of where we go next. And so this bleeds in from meaning, relationship, um, counseling and psychotherapy. Research has shown that being able to reflect and process on the new roles, responsibilities, and in relationship and caregiving is so important um, because you're setting aside, aside time to intentionally process what is going on, talking about the positives, the challenges, and also exploring feelings of grief. And I think grief is a subject that we don't talk enough about in our culture um, because we can have um, grief with any kind of diagnosis, disease, um, issue, um, or even grief over normalcy. Um, we've talked, I've read a couple articles that talk about grief during COVID, that we aren't able to have kind of the normal experiences we wanted, or we can't see family like we used to. Um, and I think that calling that grief is important and recognizing it and being able to process it. Um, the next slide, I have a couple of different books that I found are are really helpful in talking more about grief and just unpacking all of the feelings that accompany caregiving. The one on the right called Healing Your Grieving Heart When Someone You Care About Has Alzheimer's. This book was first given to me whenever I was kind of actively grieving the loss of my grandmother, um, whenever she started hospice and was kind of actively dying. I found this book to be really helpful. And since then I've referred it on to many of my clients who have told me they just love how it's broken down very simply. There are very simple ideas that they can try right away and, and have worked really well for them. And so this author is called Dr. Alan Wolfelt. And so he's really the grief expert in America. And he has so many resources and books that talk about just healing grief in different diagnoses. Um, I listed other, another two books on grief of aging, grief of chronic illness that are really great too. Um, but I encourage you to check out his website. Um, I have it on this slide, it's Center for Loss, um, but just really a wonderful resource um, for caregiving and just kind of talking about grief in general. Next slide, please. And then with all of this, I think kind of in, in terms of how we talk about meaning and relationship and accomplishment, those components of well-being, I found it, it the self-compassion aspect of ourselves and, and being compassionate to ourselves as we're learning these new things, as our relationship is changing. Um, and how we're coming to terms with what a being a caregiver means. A lot of times we don't give ourselves enough grace and enough self-compassion um, that talking with anyone else, we would um, extend that same kind of 
grace and kindness. Um, and, and so Dr. Kristen Neff is a great researcher who talks about self-compassion and she puts it simply of with self-compassion, we give ourselves the same kindness and care we give to a good friend. And so most of us have kind of this negative talker in our mind that might say kind of, oh, you weren't doing things right. You weren't doing things well enough. Why didn't you do this? Um, self-compassion fights against that of saying kind of we're giving ourselves kindness and compassion to know that we're doing everything we can and, and we're doing um, kind of everything to our best ability. And as a caregiver, this is so important, so important. Um, just before kind of logging on for this presentation, I had a session with a client that she's saying, you know, this, this, and this went wrong. This, you know, this weekend, this, like, it was just filled with bad things. Um, and so we kind of started to pick apart, well, what went right? What, what was good about this? Um, and she, she was able to find, you know, there were a lot of good things, um, but she wasn't giving herself compassion and kindness to know that, that she is doing good things. There are good, more good things than there are bad things. Um, but as a caregiver, she wants to have kind of the 100% I'm doing things right all the time. That's unrealistic. None of us can be 100% good at everything we do. Um, and and self-compassion can be a good place. So just starting to unravel that and figuring out what is my negative self-talk? What are kind of the things going on in my head that I might not be as compassionate to myself as I need to? So Kristen Neff has a great website that has several meditations, um, worksheets, quizzes to kind of figure out how compassionate am I to myself? How can I work on it? And what are some resources to help that? So um, it's a great resource if kind of what I just described is you <laughs> and, and would be helpful in kind of just building up your self-compassion, especially in the caregiving role. Next slide, please. And so the last component of well-being that we're talking about is accomplishment. And as a caregiver, we're constantly skill building and trying to figure out kind of what works, how can we um, be able to manage this disease or this situation as best as possible. And a lot of it's trial and error. Um, a lot of it is outside of our control with everything. Um, and like I said earlier, we're trying to manage kind of expectations and redefine success. So what, what is successful to us? What is a realistic goal that I can accomplish and still feel good about myself and that accomplishment? A way of doing that um, often is we try to kind of break down whatever goal it is into tiny steps. And um, so for instance, the client I was just mentioning, we were talking about, so what is the realistic goal of just being able to joke and laugh with the person you're caring for? You know that that's kind of a, a good thing for you. You feel better, they feel better. What, what are some small steps to make that happen? Um, and, and kind of just not making it as overwhelming. And I think these disease management training programs and classes like this, I think it's so important to be able to get some guidance along the way of how do we manage kind of the expectations, what's realistic, what's normal, um, and how, how do we kind of build these skills as a caregiver. And so the next slide, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about with Memory Care Home Solutions, just using this as kind of a model and case study of what a disease management program would look like. And so, like I said, it's a dementia treatment. Um, our approach is that we can't change dementia, but we know that we can change our approach as caregivers. We can modify the home environment for safety and functioning, and then also simplify the task at hand. So it's try to simplify the daily routine as much as possible so someone's able to be independent. And in, in terms of kind of what this looks like for the caregiver, um, a lot of times caregivers come to me saying, you know, I'm not doing anything right. 
everything I'm saying is upsetting to the person I'm caring for. I'm frustrated. I'm at my wit's end. I can't do this. This is too hard. And, and I think a lot of times it comes back to that feeling of accomplishment. I feel like we aren't doing anything right. Can't, we're not doing you know, the, the perfect job that we want to. And that can be very demoralizing. And so what we look at at Memory Care Home Solutions is how can we teach this problem solving approach? So I'm not giving you the answers, but we're working in partnership where we're trying to kind of build this framework of you know, with this problem, I've seen what worked with a similar problem or this worked in the past. How can I use that, kind of modify it um, and, and start building these skills for disease management? So it's kind of like just teaching a man to fish rather than giving him a fish. Um, we, do, we won't be with someone at three in the morning. We won't be with them on a Saturday afternoon. So how can we build these skills and, and build a framework for success and, and feeling that accomplishment and helping people understand how it looks different? So the next slide, I have a couple of pictures um, so these are some of our clients, um, and, and they're, this is a good example of just building small successes and redefining what accomplishment looks like. So a lot of clients come to us with just saying, you know, Mary's not doing anything anymore. She used to love to cook, love to bake, but now she can't do anything. And so she just sits in front of the TV. Um, and and so with dementia, a lot of it is that, well, there's a lot of things fighting against us. Dementia itself takes away the ability to initiate an activity. And so even though Mary might want to bake, her brain just isn't sure how to get started. And so if we can kind of help break it down and make it step by step and help Mary do the steps that she's able to do and that don't really matter if they're done well, um, then, then that's what we're looking for. And so an example of that is like putting the cookies on the cookie sheet. So she might not be able to get all the ingredients out. She might not be able to put them all together. Um, so maybe the caregiver assembles everything and, but she can roll them out, put them on the baking sheet and then cook them. And, and so it's, it's kind of trying to redefine what is accomplishment? Um, because a lot of caregivers say, you know, before we're able to break things down step by step, I didn't feel any accomplishment whenever she was just sitting in front of the TV. But now that I see she's engaged in something that is meaningful to her, that sense of accomplishment is there. And so it's, it, it's a lot of skill building, but it can be so meaningful and purposeful as a caregiver to feel that accomplishment, to feel like you're able to make things better in the disease or whatever condition or whatever situation, the person that you're caring for. And so ours is, like I said, specific to dementia um, and it's available to anyone across the country, um, anyone who needs support. But there are a lot of disease management programs from diabetes, Parkinson's, um, really anything. And so if you haven't already, I would connect with a group that might be specific for your needs um, or a local area agency on aging because support and, and training is out there and, and you deserve it for yourself to feel accomplished and, and to feel those successes as a caregiver. And so I, I think the next slide, I have my information. Oh, no, <laughs> one, one more to go. So this is just kind of further going back to PERMA um, so like I said, the acronym positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, accomplishment. Um, as we finish up today, I think looking at all of those different components and how, how do you measure them? How would you rate your well-being in all of these different areas? And what is a small step in the next 24 hours to kind of take you to where you'd like to be? And I think on the next slide, I have my information. Um, so my phone number, my email, our website, and our YouTube channel, which has a lot of um, videos on caregiving, dementia, and home modifications. And I encourage you, if you have any questions about today's presentation, 
um, are interested in learning more about our caregiver training program, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to talk with anyone and, and would love to support you. And so I'll give it over to Calvin um, and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, thank you for spending your uh, expertise and this, um, this afternoon with us. Uh, I think we should get right into questions. I'm going to launch a poll, a little evaluation poll while we're at it. So uh, feel free to fill that out. Uh, we have one listener who wanted to know um, how they can kind of shake that feeling or, or that um, the worry that they, they don't feel they're doing enough for the person they're taking care of. And really how this comes into play is that once, you know, eventually they're gone, they're wondering if they're going to have any feelings of regret or guilt for things they may or, you know, things they felt they could have done or should have done or might have done. What would, you mm. be, what would your response be to that? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's such a great question. And I, I go back to kind of what we talked about with um, the benefits of counseling and psychotherapy. I think being able to talk to a counselor and just unpack um, what, what the feeling is of not enough, what that really looks like, um, and, and all of the feelings that go along with that. Um, because it, I, I think further determining kind of is the, the feeling of not being able to do enough. Are there things within our control that we feel like we're not doing enough of? Are there things outside of our control? Um, and just being able to further define that. Um, cause right now it seems like it's a little gray, it's kind of ambiguous and it feels like a, a bigger kind of problem. How do I manage that? I think counseling would be a good, a good resource for that person. Thanks. We have another question from a listener who wanted to know, um, I know you gave a couple different techniques and also, um, app suggestions for kind of, um, uh, stress management and self-care. This person wanted to know, are there any words that they might say to themselves? Maybe almost like a mantra when they're feeling uh, a little bit overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my clients um, say things like, I'm doing the best I can. I am enough. I am well. Um, kind of giving a positive affirmation for yourself of like what, what you want to be, what you want to embody. Um, and so the, also just words like peace, comfort, um, I think having a mantra like that can be very helpful. We have another listener who is having, um, some difficulty controlling his, uh, his anger. I guess he, you know, he doesn't want to, to snap or, or, you know, maybe, uh, lash out, but he's, he's having trouble, difficulty. Uh, he's having difficulty in managing these kind of very strong emotions. Do you have any advice um, for him and how the um, kind of this, this idea of well-being might be able to help him out in a situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the thing that I often hear with those strong emotions is that kind of the more we fight against them, the more that we try to push them down and not recognize them, the more they come up. Um, and, and so if you kind of think like, um, all of the stress, all of the worry, all of the challenges are like water in a cup. And we keep adding the stress, we keep adding the frustration with no relief, that cups get up overflow. And, and so I think with the, the strong feelings of anger and frustration, sadness, often those can just bubble up at kind of the times where we don't really expect them. Um, it might be something that we really aren't too upset about, but just because everything's been piling up, then it explodes. And then we might feel some relief, but there also might be guilt there too. And, and so I think in, in these situations, it's important to almost think of like, how are you building kind of release valves if we're going along with the water analogy of just releasing some of that stress, some of that frustration and building that into your routine. Um, and, and that's where kind of the, the well-being components, if you're able to build that into your routine consistently, the hope is that, that those emotions will have a place to go. You'll be able to process through them. 
be able to build coping strategies of kind of managing them and not let it kind of get to the place where everything overflows. Thank you, Amy. We have another another listener who I, I know this is from you know our own experience, and I'm sure you've had um, experience with your own clients. But we have um, a question about caregiving with de- um, depression. Someone um, who has maybe had some you know maybe mental health issues beforehand in terms of you know depression and sadness, uh, and now they're a caregiver. So is there is there any advice or suggestions you might give for how to manage? both caregiving and, you know, certain uh, mental health um, Mm -hmm. um, problems that uh, many people struggle with? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's such a great question. Um, Because I think most of, almost everyone has kind of um, some mental health challenge that they've managed or dealt with their whole life, whether it's recognized or not. Um, and, And I think in terms of caregiving, it just kind of increases the intensity a lot. Um, and so with my clients, I found that being able to establish good boundaries is essential, especially at the beginning of recognizing what is my limit, what are things that are my triggers, and I know that will lead to poor mental health or kind of have me spiraling. And being able to know that's not a role that I can take on, that's not a task I can do, because I know it's going to negatively affect me. Um, and, and unpacking that, um, I think, again, a counselor can help with just figuring out kind of what are those boundaries? What, what are my limits? Um, but also just kind of spending some time with yourself of figuring out when am I most frustrated? Um, so like if you're providing a caregiving role or, or task, um, almost like keeping a journal of, so today this, my mood was this and, seeing if there's a pattern um, and you can kind of start to figure out where those boundaries might need to be. Thanks. We have another question um, um, someone asked on the registration form. It's uh, it appears to be, I guess, a, uh, like a sandwich, uh, sandwich caregiver. So someone who is an mm-hmm. adult who is, has an adult as a parent who is um, living with dementia, but they also have, young children, what, how do you recommend, um, especially with your uh, experience, how do you recommend they kind of talk with their children or kind of involve their children in this, um, in, a, in a grandparent, I guess, this case would be, who is um, who's gonna, you know, be going on this kind of dementia progression? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's such a great question. And I think so many families are kind of managing that reality. Um, depending on how old the children are, there are a lot of great resources, um, different books, videos, kind of worksheets that children can do. Um, the younger children, more like grade school, I see a lot of like picture books and, and things that just kind of help talk about the disease and symptoms in an age appropriate way. Um, a lot of it focuses around kind of not blaming grandma or grandpa or whoever the family member is and, and helping them understand like this, this is a disease. It's not grandma disliking you or, or being angry at you um, and helping them kind of delineate that. I find a lot of times too, having kind of set roles is helpful. And so um, giving that child a purpose of kind of, oh, grandma wants to play with you or grandma wants to read with you. Um, helping them feel like they're part of the caregiving team as well. So I think we have just time for maybe two more questions. We have another listener who is caregiving for um, a mother-in-law. And um, I guess what has happened is her, um, the caregiver's husband has kind of felt that this is really her, her job to take care of the mother-in-law and has kind of, kind of, uh, you know, separated himself from, from um, any kind of um, helping out. So she finds herself um, largely, you know, kind of it's taking, you know, taking on this responsibility without much support, it seems. So what what might you mm-hmm. recommend um, for her in terms of maybe reaching out, finding support, or maybe um, speaking with her husband to try and um, get him a little bit more involved? Yeah, so 
And unfortunately, this is kind of a common problem. Um, I would say that a lot of times coming from a professional, like a doctor or therapist or counselor, sometimes family members take that in a better way. And so like, if I was telling my husband, I need help, I need you to do this. Um, he might not take that as well as if our, my mom's doctor said, oh, you need to help Amy more. You need to do this. Um, sometimes coming from an outside source can be helpful. Um, and that's a lot of what we do in, at Memory Care Home Solutions of just trying to get everyone on the same page, because we know that one caregiver caring for someone is a recipe for failure. It'll end, end poorly for that person because they need a team around them. They need more support than just they can provide. Thanks. Um, and I think we have just time for one last question. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll ask this one. I was wondering in terms of for all our listeners, what, what might you recommend something they could do today, maybe this afternoon, or maybe just right after the call, something that might have a nice um, kind of outsized impact for the amount of effort that is involved mm -hmm. in terms of uh, promoting well-being? Yeah. So I think first of all, just give yourself appreciation that you took the time to attend this presentation today. Um, I think building on that success, choose one of the kind of meditation, mindfulness, brief resources, just one of those things and try to look at it in the next 24 hours. Um, Cause I, I think just building your knowledge of what's out there and being appreciative of yourself and that you are caring for yourself is important. Perfect, thank you, Amy. I think that's um, just about the time we have for today. I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar, which was presented again by Amy, Amy Sabrino. These uh, webinars that FCR produces are free. We do them every month. Next month, we're gonna be talking about paid family leave and that'll be in two sessions. We'll do one session in English and then a couple days in Spanish for anyone who might, um, uh, might have family um, who is uh, monolingual in Spanish. Uh, for more information, you can visit our website, caregiver.org. Again, we will get all the slides up and we'll get a copy of the webinar up, a recording, if you'd like to view it again. Thanks again, Amy, for um, joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Um, so the webinar is concluded. We hope to see you for the next one. Please, um, please stay, stay safe. Um, what with everything that's going on these days. Um, I will leave the webinar open for a little bit longer for anyone who is, uh, hasn't had a chance to complete the polls, but um, or sorry, the eval, but who might uh, want to give a little bit of feedback. We certainly would appreciate that. But for now, the, uh, the webinar is completed. And um, thanks again for attending. We hope you have a, a great, uh, safe holiday season.